Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. My name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. Well, everybody, the day has finally come. Today, we're going to talk about the films of Mr. Ringo Starr, movie star himself and Oscar winner, Stephen. He's an Oscar winner. Yes, indeed. And yes, indeed. But not for his acting. No, no, and not, uh, not for his, not for his singing either. No, but, just uh, for being in the room. <laughs> in the room. Uh, for let it be, um, and even though we've had lots of requests from people to you know talk about a hard day's night or help, we're going straight to the important movies here, where we're going to talk about the movies where Ringo is, his name is up on the marquee. Yeah, even, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, yeah <laughs> if top, these top, movies even made it to the cinema, I was going to say it's top billing, even though he's not necessarily the top leading actor. But uh, no, but it's it's an interesting body of work, and uh, I, I think it's fair to say that we're, this, this is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a laid back look at Ringo's movie career. But you know, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And Stephen, you have sat down and watched all of these films. I was going to say, you know, it, it, it's 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 an episode that I think commanded the most research. <laughs> certainly, certainly, time certainly wise. Time wise, and we, we we both put the R's in. Yes, and uh, it's it's also one of these ideas that wouldn't die. I'm I'm I'm, I'm mindful of you know when when Monty Python had Holy Grail out, somebody said, "What's your next movie?" and they just jokingly said, uh, "Jesus Christ, Lust for Glory," and that was an idea that just eventually turned into Life of Brian. And I think we were knocking about podcast ideas and the films of Ringo Starr just wouldn't go away it just was begging I, to be done I think yeah I think you're setting the bar quite high <laughs> comparing it with Life of Brian but but yes I get your, I get your yeah. point I get your point so um yeah the, so the way I see it Stephen is uh, you know Ringo's always been around he's always been you know he's always liked a camera he's never been shy but the main no. body of his movie work we're kind of looking at this 1968 to 1981 arc of a career the rise sort of and, and the rise and rise and of then Ringo the opposite Star. of a rise um yeah. but it, it's kind of we'll, we'll, we'll address this when we look at the movies it's kind of in three parts where he starts off and he's in the beatles and it becomes like his accessory career and then he finds himself solo and he's given it a serious go yeah and then time passes and he's maybe enjoying the lifestyle more than the art of acting. Yes, I think that, I think that's fair. Comment. That's, that's, I think that's fair. fair uh, but Ringo, I guess we we have to start by saying, you know, he he gets this label of being an actor because of his hard days night moment, doesn't he? Yes, the walk along the canal and the summoning up the the pathos of of the the common man, <laughs> uh, or 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 just hungover. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's that too because he was hungover, wasn't he? he yeah, was, he was. Yeah, yeah. He well, he he, he says very sort of disarmingly. Uh, yeah, I got a lot of single out for a lot of praise for that scene, but really, I just had a hard night the night before and literally a hard night night (laughs) and uh it it, it seems to give him though a certain license that he gets this label of being the actor after a hard day's night and you know hard day's night is brilliant and we'll do an episode on a hard day's night at some point but he you know he's literally just being ringo uh being handed a script where they're all being heightened versions of themselves and it's he's not really acting he's but he's very charismatic and there's a difference he's Yes, what you're trying to say is he's just, all he has to do is act naturally. Hey. <laughs> um, but yes. yeah, I mean, I think, but, but, but I think one of the things is that, that he's also the, the key player in, in the help plot. He, yes, you know, this he's, is he's true. The, he's the sort of everything else sort of revolves around him. So he's, he is kind of put forward into that front and center uh, role. And even in, in Magical Mystery Tour, you know, yeah. he's the one on, on the bus with Aunt Jessie. Again, he's got a little bit more dialogue, such as it is. Yeah, but uh, Magical Mystery Tour is where you see that kind of style of Ringo acting, which is kind of totally... It's this very kind of dead <laughs> unsubtle. Pan, unsubtle hat. But that, that I mean, uh, uh, there is a certain charm to that. Yeah. And, and, and you, you know, it's, it is his sort of calling card. And when it works, it's spectacular. But yeah. when it really is not, appropriate <laughs> it's, it it's not out. spectacular yeah yeah and listen who are we to mock or judge he has made significantly more films than you or i Stephen. 
This well, so far, so far until the nothing is real movie hits the big screen. Yes. Um, so let's let's get down to it because uh, you know it did take a global pandemic for us to sit down in 2020 and pass the time in front of these movies. It was a perfect way it to we, pass the time. Yeah, just to, to see what the world has to offer. Um, so let's look at this first phase where he's in the Beatles and he is making movies. And there's two movies that fall under this remit, which are Candy from 1968 and The Magic Christian from 1969. So let's start with Candy. What's Candy about? Well, do you want to put in a disclaimer at this point? This is true. We did talk, Uh, myself and Stephen, off mic that there are certain topics that are coming up uh, in discussing the movies of Ringo Starr that are, might have an adult tone. So if you've got children or, you know, loved ones in and around (laughs) wherever you're listening to your podcasts, um, just be mindful that the topics might go into um, the the body. Should we say the body? Slightly, slightly body. Slightly slightly body. body. It's of its, you know, these films are of their time. Yes. So tell us about Um, the sex farce candy. (laughs) Okay. Well, you know, it's a a common everyday story. Uh, High school student candy Christian's descends to earth from space Mm. Uh, following a poetry recital uh, she uh, goes home with Richard Burton right and uh, uh, one of the critics described uh, as seems permanently to be walking into a headwind uh, (laughs) with his hair Uh, she has many adventures sex with many men and then returns to space (sighs) and it could only have been made in 1968 probably it is. I mean, this is this is based on a novel from the late fifties, but uh, and supposedly it's a satire on pornographic stories, but sort of generally ends up just being a pornographic story itself. Yeah, there's I a think. there's a certain type of um, uh, there's a certain type of thing in the late sixties that presents itself as some kind of liberalized way of thinking about sex and life and actually it's just yeah. more of the same male wish fulfillment fantasy bs really well you're uh, yes and these also these sort of big ensemble pieces where you have half a dozen or a dozen stars of the day you know i'm thinking woody allen sex comedies yeah that style of thing everything you wanted to know about sex uh well uh, terry what's, southern what's had been the, involved in casino royale the year before ex, ex, exactly which so is a similar terry, kind of vibe terry, yeah, so it's that, it is that, it's it's absolutely of its time, 67, 68, 69, could not have been made any other time. Um, and Terry Southern, Southern has a, yeah, he's an interesting guy, because he, he casts a spell over these movies in a way. He does, I mean, he's, he's I didn't know much about him, um, but he's been, he sort of was present in all of the cool places, so he was in Paris uh, after the war, a sort of literary scene there. He moved to Greenwich Village in uh, the 1950s. He's hanging out with the Beats uh, in Swinging London in the 60s. As you say, he wrote dialogue for Doctor Strangelove, Casino Royale, Barbarella, yeah. if you know that film. Yeah. Again, very much... Uh, I was going to say of a, of a piece with candy, you know, uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, films as a teenager. I should say. Um, <laughs> well, there are certain movies in in this that kind of. Uh, do you remember um, what was it called? Was it uh, Movie Drome when Alex Cox used to present yes, these BBC yes. Two movies on a Sunday night? They used to pop up in that slot. This is about yep. uh, I think late eighties, early nineties on BBC Two, and it'd be Sunday night. Here's a cult film, and so these kind of movies would pop up. I remember Barbarella popped up there one week. Um, After your- Parents, after your parents have gone to bed, <laughs> but Barbarella uh, is is kind of good. You know, it it's it still, is it, it still is. casts yes. a bit of a it still has a bit of cultural impact. You know, Kylie made a Barbarella video. You know, in do homage. You, do you remember the uh, the name of the Milo O'Shea character? Wasn't it Duran Duran? Duran Duran. Duran Duran. So, so yeah, yeah, so with that there to blame for Duran Duran. But, <laughs> it, but it's interesting because Terry Southern, um, who's who's involved in a couple of Ringo pro- projects, you kind of think, man, why was Ringo? tying his his wagon to this guy but he's been involved in as you say Dr. Strange of Casino Royale Barbarella yep. he gets involved after this with Easy Rider so he does have form and he does he has been involved in some notable projects he does and then he he, he seems to sort of fall on hard times hmm. uh, so he's got a blink and you'll miss it cameo in The Man Who Fell to Earth yeah and and then tragically he ends up writing for Saturday Night Live. Yeah, now he writes in early 80s Saturday Night Live. So I, I, I'm quite a Saturday Night Live uh, fan and Stephen is the opposite. Fair to say? 
I think that's very fair. Um, and he wrote in the 81-82 season where Lorne Michaels had left and the cast was in free fall and turnover and they were trying to kind of rebuild uh, the show. Um, but I don't actually know what uh, particular pieces he he wrote for the, the show. The, the writer's room was kind of a, a different thing back then. Um, and then he, he, he's, he, he dies in the 90s. He kind of doesn't... Um, he doesn't really have a final act. No, he just he just sort of fades away. Yeah, um, but as you say, Ringo Ringo is involved in this project, Magic Christian, and he also at one point had had uh, sort of optioned another story called Blue Movie. Do we know what that's about? I have, I have no idea. Oh, okay, um, it does what it says on the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd worry. Is it, is it literally a blue movie? <laughs> um, but it, it was never made. Um, but but he does seem to be very sort of present Terry mm. Southern mm. In, in the late 60s. Um, there is a soundtrack to Candy that came out on Apple, but only in the US, I think. Who's on that? Um, is, is Ringo on that? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, he Ringo, we should say, Ringo has a very, I'm tempted to say he's a very small part, but that's just... Steady. That's innuendo. <laughs> Carry on, Candy. For the sake of innuendo. But he, he, he plays a Mexican gardener. Well, full disclosure here, Stephen. Out of all the movies we're talking about today, uh, there's two of them I have not seen in full, and Candy is one of them, because... You know, you know, life is you too children short. children in the house. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that, that's true. <laughs> and everybody's in the house these days. Um, so, uh, you, Candy, you really can just dial up the five minutes that Ringo is in. And um, it's, it's, it's on YouTube and he plays a Mexican gardener. And he, it's, it's, it's as... Bad it's as sh- it's as shockingly bad as you you would imagine, like cultural appropriation or whatnot, you know. But he's you know, see, Monsieur, and all that kind of stuff. But it's even even leaving that aside, it's it's a shocking piece of miscasting. Well, here's the thing I find interesting about this because this movie is in 1968, and uh, if my timeline is right, he he leaves the recording of the White Album to go off and do yep. some of this, and he is. Like we we can look back now and kind of laugh at some of this, but he is goddamn it, Ringo from the Beatles in the summer of nineteen sixty eight. What's he doing? What is the path that gets him on a plane and into a studio to record this awful scene in a film? Like it's it's it just well, doesn't make sense. Well, I think you don't have to look further than the cast list. Yeah. So, so we'll go I mean, through the list there. Okay. Well, I mean, Candy herself, mm. uh, you know, she, she was an unknown. She was uh, Miss Teen Sweden in 1965, <laughs> uh, Miss Teen International in 1966. Right. And um, she, she, best... was, she, was, uh, she was 15 when she was Miss Teen Sweden. So she's 18 yes. when she makes Candy. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Um, she looks a bit like Catherine Deneuve. Yeah. Um, but the best quote in the sort of reviews, uh, you know, she went on to star in several films after this and said many of her films were sex comedies set in the Middle <laughs> Ages. I think that, that tells you all you need to know. Okay. But but the, the, the key thing here for Ringo, I suspect, is the rest of the cast. So you've got James Coburn. Yeah. Walter Matthau. Yeah. John Houston. Yeah. Martin Brando. Yeah, Brando pops up, yeah. So why would you not want to be... You know, these were big yeah, no, stars. It's, 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 and it's, yeah, and it's, it's, it's really a curious thing. Um, and Ringo comes in as a Mexican gardener and it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a strange scene and he ends up squiring candy and. How very delicately put. Yes. Squiring is um, what I'm well, going to call it. He's squiring candy while Richard Burton is squiring a mannequin in the background. But it just, it does give, <laughs> yeah, that's true. It does give, a, <laughs> it does give um, an impression as to just some of the chaos that's around the Beatles in 68 that a good manager wouldn't have, like, like I can't see Epstein uh, and, would have signed no, off on that at I, all. I think Brian, Brian Epstein, but you remember this is Brian Epstein sort of said you can't go near uh um you know the, this topic or that topic for yeah. your follow-up um your follow-up film that you know they they looked around uh joe wharton you yeah know, he wasn't he wasn't letting him near the joe wharton script so no i think i think uh brian epstein would not have let uh and i mean i don't think we can really recommend anybody go on no, watch did, this film. no it's just it's just terrible so that's candy from 1968 marks out of 10 Stephen. 
Two out of ten. Two out of ten. Right. But it is inexorably kind of linked to the other film that Ringo makes when he's still in The Beatles, which is The Magic Christian, which is probably more well known. And that comes out in 1969. It's made in February 69, just after the uh, Let It Be session. So January 69 is is one. This is one of the pressures on that session that Ringo is committed to doing this. So those sessions have to end at a certain point. And this is what he Um, does between Let It Be and eventually getting back into what becomes Abbey Road. Yes, and again, there's a sort of a broader connection because there's a soundtrack that's on Apple, yep. and uh, the big song is "Come and Get It" by Paul McCartney, I believe Paul is McCartney. his name. So, um, so the Magic Christian. Well, uh, I mean, uh, people here probably uh, out of all these movies, this is the one that they they might have seen. Hmm. Um, but what's it about? A millionaire adopts a homeless man and together they bribe everyone they meet to do things they would never usually do in order to make a point about money and capitalism or something. Yes, it's a bit preachy and it's, it stars Ringo and Peter Sellers. Yes. And Peter Sellers is this kind of eccentric, uh, very wealthy millionaire person and he, uh, Ringo is a... Uh, homeless guy sleeping homeless in a park sleeping in the park and yeah. peter sellers just uh, adopts them and they go about it's basically a series of sketches of them doing outrageous things with money it is and again it's uh, it, again it's 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 a style of film that comes from the late 60s yeah um you know and it, it has every sort of british character actress or actor mm. working there you know you've got hattie jakes so you've got you, you know you've got uh Proto Monty Python, John Cleese, Graham Chapman, yeah. uh, Richard Attenborough is in it. He is. Um, it's I I I like this film. I have to say, it's it's uh, yeah. I mean, it was it was set up to be kind of Ringo's big break, mm. as far as I can see, because he's a co-starring role. Peter Sellers is always fascinating to watch, whether yeah. he's appearing on the Sykes sitcom or whether he's you know uh, you know headlining in a you know being there. He, he's always. A very magnetic performer and obviously him and Ringo were friends yes I mean Sellers is sort of moving in their circle yeah um, and I think uh, they were all Goons fans you know Sellers was uh, sort of instrumental in that coming out of the late 50s early 60s um, but I think he was genuinely fascinated by stardom mm. uh, Sellers was fascinated by stardom and, and other so I think he was sort of intrigued to be in that world. Yeah. And again, it's uh, Terry Southern who wrote yeah. a book in 1959. And the original book was set in the US. And then the, the, the script gets a pass through from John Cleese and Graham Chapman, who at the time, um, this would have been pre-Monty Python. Monty Python doesn't hit the air till October 69. And this is being filmed at the start of 69. So uh, Monty Python hasn't even happened yet, but they are television writers uh, writing for shows like The Frost Report and Doctor in the House and uh, At Last the 1948 Show um, yep. that they are in. So they are starting to make a name for it. And it's it's kind of obvious when you watch it that the the, the bits that aren't in the book originally uh, are the scenes with Cleese, which is in an auction house, and the scenes with Chapman, which is the Oxford-Cambridge boat race. They, they're the bits that they obviously shoehorned in themselves. Yes. I mean, the Cleese sketch is just Monty Python. The Cleese sketch is probably the best bit. And you yeah. see Cleese uh, being, you know, before he became so wheezy and miserable, <laughs> which, is <how> I, <laughs> which is how I see him today. Um, but he, uh, I, I think Cleese is, you know, all the things that he became famous for in subsequent years is in his little scene, this kind of yes. repressed, snobbery, you know, haughty, attitude um it is probably the best scene in the film and it, it is it, it is obviously a python written scene in disguise clearly i mean it, it it you you could take that little sketch and put it into any python yeah uh, show i think and it would it would work it it, it uh it, it's very interesting to see the origins uh in uh, there, yeah. In there, yeah. And uh, Graham Chapman's a bit more fleeting, but um, I have to say, overall, I don't like The Magic Christian. You didn't like it? I, well, you see, I first saw it about, it must have been about 25 years ago, and it came out on home video, VHS, mm. you remember, tapes. Yeah. And uh, I bought it, and I was like, oh, I'm so looking forward to seeing this. It's Monty Python, it's The Beatles, it's Peter Sellers, this is going to be fantastic. And it's kind of, it's got that, Again, it's 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 obviously of its time, but it's so unsubtle and it's so kind of 
Yeah, there's a, there's a deep you cynicism know, to it, you know. Oh, do you know? Well, do you know? But the but the, what I what I liked about it is there's there's lots of sort of business going on in the background to every scene. Yeah. So you you have a scene on a train and Hattie Jakes is there and she's reading a book about kind of Nazi war crimes yeah, and it's is. never mentioned or <laughs> alluded to and it's just so every every scene has something else yeah uh going on some of it is uh, as you say it's it's very unsubtle and it does kind of bang you over the head with the the sort of the moral and uh yeah and it's I, a little, it's, that ending uh, is very annoying it's very kind of the, gross the ending, and grim. It, it, it 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 reminds me of those uh spike milligan q yeah shows yeah. where they just they don't know how to end a sketch so they just go what are we going to do now what are yeah. we going to do now and they wander off camera and it is a bit yeah, it, there's no resolution to anything. And there is no plot to it. It's basically just a set of, a series of, you know, setups for them to yes. spend their money. Now, there's a, it, one of my favorite films of that era, because I'm a Monkeys fan, is the movie Head, which Head, is, yeah. is a movie I, I, I really love and I've watched many, many times. But I've watched it many times because I think the musical set pieces are great mm. and they're quite charismatic and it is kind of, uh, it does poke fun and it's, it's you know, of, of, of the TV show and it's got the TV show to refer to. Whereas something like this, I'm not sure, it's hard to know who it's for really, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's probably true. I think if you went to see this in the cinema in 1969, you'd have find it hilarious. You yeah. know? Um, it is a period piece. Um, again, it's got a great cast. If you want to see Yul Brynner in drag. Yes. Um, uh, if you want to see uh, Raquel Welch. Yeah, and if yeah, but be warned, it's got Rowan Polanski in it as well. Um, there's that's a, true. There's a that's couple true. of things. I've forgotten, I, I've forgotten about that. I, I, I rewatched it again, obviously, for the purposes of science. Uh, and there's a couple of interesting bits on it. It has the day in the life chord is in it. There's a there's yes. a bit where yes. they get off the, the boat and the, you hear the day in, the actual chord from uh, the end of a day in the life. And mm -hmm. the, the, the magic Christian in the movie is a, is a ship and it's this famous launch. And you actually see John and Yoko lookalikes getting onto the ship. Yes, because when I first saw this film, which would have been before Movie Drome, there was a sort of, it was probably on a Saturday night when I was about 14 or 15. Yeah. They would show these movies from the 60s, you know, Magic Christian, Two Lane Blacktop, Steel Yard Blues, yeah. uh, uh, Silent Running, Dark Star, all of those movies. I actually thought it was real uh, news footage. Yeah of uh, John and Yoko getting <laughs> onto the ship. But it was very disappointing to find out that uh, it was just lookalike. But it is interesting. Um, the, the choreographer is Lionel Blair, who was in A Hard Day's Night. Um, it does have a scene that reminds me, I know we said um, Cleese and Chapman are in it. It does have that scene in the restaurant, which is a bit like the meaning of life, Mr. Creosote scene many years yes. later, where yes. he's just getting food thrown at him. I, I, I That also reminded me of the, you know, spaghetti and magical mystery tour yeah yeah that's true um and and sellers as i said is always is always worth watching and the, the scenes and at the end in the south bank it's interesting to see a an, an unbuilt it, south bank in london yes, uh, yes the nft or the bfi south bank but the absolute star apart from it's very good soundtrack oh, yes. what is your favorite soundtrack. moment stephen well my favorite <laughs> well well uh, well, I I have watched certain scenes more than once. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so what's and, your favorite I, scene? Today? Well, well, I may have watched the Raquel Welch scene more than once, yes. or twice, yeah. or maybe three times. But the real the real star of this film <laughs> is Ringo's hair. Ringo's hair is is absolutely you know, gorgeous. I mean, he, he's front of Let It Be. Ringo is what he is. It's, his hair is amazing. It's like he just stepped out of a shampoo advert. Yeah. Um, um, and my other favorite bit is at the end when he's doing the free money here sign, and, yes. and he runs out of space to write here. It reminded me of John Mulaney has a bit about when you write a happy birthday sign, you always run out of space. Yeah. And uh, so he kind of runs out of space as he's spray painting the sign. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, but it's uh, it just has a certain kind of um, um, yeah, it's just it's just a bit odd. I love I love this film. <laughs> I love this film. This is what we 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 part company here. I I just thought this film was great. Well, it it has popped up, and something I realized watching all these films again is one of my favorite things at the minute, particularly in the year twenty twenty, is the channel Talking Pictures TV. Yes, uh, and you're a fan of Talking Pictures TV I, too. I am. I am indeed. And if people are listening, because we've got listeners around the world, but if you don't know what Talking Pictures TV is, it's this television channel. 
um, that's based in the UK, that's on the regular UK free to air uh, wavelengths, digital wavelengths. Um, but it seems to have been around about two or three years. And I, I read about it. It's, it's basically run by a guy who used to work in media and has been collecting old movies and copyrights. And they basically broadcast from a, a, a an expanded garage at the bottom of their garden. Shed. Yeah, yeah. It's a family broadcast from a shed. But they show all these movies and TV shows that you really have forgotten about, that people have kind of passed by. And a few weeks ago, they did show The Magic Christian and it got a huge amount of traction online. People were very interested to watch it again. I think they showed it about three or four times. But it's a fascinating yeah. little channel. And some of the other movies we're going to talk about have also popped up on Talking Pictures TV. It's uh, and it kind of, what I find interesting about Talking Pictures TV is it gives you a context to kind of forgive uh, some of these movies if they're not very good, it doesn't matter because you're signing up to see something that's just kind of different. Do you know what I mean? No, no, exactly. And one, one of my sort of pet hates about the modern world, you know, stand by for 15 minutes. On oh, here we go. The modern world. Go on. Um, Are you going to go full? Uh, what was it? Stephen Stills? <laughs> <laughs> when, when I, no, but when, when I was a teenager all those years ago, um, you could stumble across this type of film. Yes on BBC Two on a Saturday night. So they would run a series of kind of horror movies or sort of 60s movies. So I saw The Magic Christian. I saw uh, uh, Silent Running. I saw that type of film. Nowadays, you can't stumble across mm. films like that. You know, you, certainly you can see, uh, you know, uh, how often has um, Indiana Jones, yeah. you know, they just, they just show that film. Shaun of the Dead again. on ITV2. Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, they, they just they just continually, well, uh, and there's nowhere to, to sort of stumble across. There's, you well, know, that's stumbling exactly. Stumbling across things is a great thing. And to, that, that, Talking that, Pictures TV channel. should call themselves Perfect. the Stumble Across Channel. They had a, yeah. a few weeks ago, I found myself watching a Sean Connery film from 1974 set in Norway, where he's single-handedly trying to get rid of some um, uh, plain... Um, uh, some people who'd taken over a plane called Ransom. It was bonkers. It was great. And I'd never heard of it. So Magic Christian, sorry, did you give your mark out of 10 for Magic Christian? Um, well, I, you won't agree with this, but I'm going seven out of 10 for Magic Christian. Yeah, I give it two or three out of 10. I just find it just... Really? It, it, really? You think you think, you think think it's as bad as Candy? No, it's not as bad as Candy. So 4.3 or something, I, I guess. 4.3, 4.3. It, it, just, it just makes me feel uncomfortable. And maybe that's the point. Uh, I just, it just, yeah. It just well, you, just, you were watching it, it keep waiting for the kids or your wife to come into the room that's why you were uncomfortable <laughs> say, what 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 the hell is this um, how many times how many times are you going to watch Raquel Welsh uh just the once or twice so <laughs> but that is Ringo's big uh movie debut co-starring Ooh. role he's in the Beatles he's in the Magic Christian and then there's kind of a bit of a gear shift because the Beatles split Yes. And we kind of get into a couple of movies where Ringo, it seems to me, or maybe this is obvious in retrospect, he's trying to become a bit of a hyphenate. You know, he's, you know, doing music. He's uh, in movies. He's making movies. He's, you know, being all things to all people. He's appearing on different albums. And the next movie on the list is Blind Man from 1971. Yeah. And, and that is in the middle of Ringo's busyness. It is. I mean, this is an incredibly busy period between 1970 and 72. So he's got two solo albums, standalone singles. He's recording with George and John and Yoko. Concert for Bangladesh. He's uh, recording with Stephen Stills, Leon Russell, B.B. King. Um, you know, phenomenal work rate. Yeah. And, um, and trying to be a movie star. And trying to be a movie star. So... Blind Man, this is the film you said you had watched or had No, watched? this is the one film on the list that I have not watched because it's not on YouTube. <laughs> and well, I wasn't going to buy a DVD. It was just my, well, my... Uh, then for your benefit. But I know benefit. somebody who did buy a DVD and... Uh, I, I, yes, I, I did buy the DVD, of all for research. For science. And, uh, when, when I put the DVD in the DVD player, That's it what played you in yeah. Italian. <laughs> but and, it is an uh, Italian spaghetti Western, Blind Man. Yes, but there were no subtitles, Jason. No. And, and but does Ringo speak in uh, Italian? It was all it was all overdubbed okay. very badly. Classic spaghetti um, western style in Italian. But for, but <laughs> as you haven't, I, I'll describe uh, uh, this film for you. It is a gritty tale of double and triple crossing in the white slavery trade of the Old West, featuring. <laughs> you might want to take notes at this point. I'll start writing. A blind bounty hunter, <laughs> right? Who, with the help of his trusty seeing eye horse, <laughs> right? <laughs> 
takes on bloodthirsty bandits and the Mexican army in his quest to deliver 50 mail order brides to hard up miners in Texas. Jeez, I mean, we've, we've, all, been, we've all been there. That, yeah, I mean, oh, <laughs> that old chestnut. That old chestnut. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is a this is a crazy film. It, um, I mean, from the clips and the trailers and things I've looked at, it does look good. I mean, it looks like a authentic spaghetti western. It it does. I mean, it 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 has it has that real feel about it. And what I would say is, anybody sitting down to watch this who had seen Ringo in a Hard Day's <laughs> Night and Help yeah. and Magical Mystery Tour and Magic Christian, this is not the same beast at all. No. Um, it's uh, an Alan Klein Abco production, which explains why Ringo's there. Which kind of explains why he's there. And um, Alan Klein makes an uncredited appearance, <laughs> playing As... the part. You like this bit, <laughs> playing the part of a sweaty double-crossing bandit. So typecasting. All he had to do was act naturally. <laughs> yeah, all he had to do was turn up. <laughs> um, Matt Evans is in it. Yeah, yeah, he's in it as one of Klein's sidekicks. Um, it's it's. Ringo, Ringo is sort of giving given pretty high billing in this, but he, he it's a very small role in this film, and they're really sort of exploiting his name, I think, just to get people in. Um, it's very violent, mm. uh, you know. It's very dated in its treatment of the the female characters. Uh, Ringo himself has some extremely hard to watch scenes of violence sure. to to women, and they, they, I mean that. Uh, you know, it's shocking now. It must have been more shocking um, if you were expecting a sort of mop top comedy, magic Christian style. Well, here's here's a top fact for you because uh, in the research for this, uh, you were saying that this was filmed in Almeria in Spain. Yes, and I might have been on the set of Blind Man because when I was a young kid, uh, we used to go on a package holiday every summer. And mm -hmm. I remember one year we went to Almeria in Spain and there's two connections there. First one is that I remember, so I would have been about eight and we went to a place called Little Hollywood, which was a movie set open to the public where they shot spaghetti westerns. Now, history does not recall whether this was the exact place where they shot Blind Man, but it would seem likely if I visited uh, a spaghetti western uh, studio in Almeria in Spain that this is the same place. I would have thought so. You would, you would think so. Um, and my other connection to Al Maria is on the same holiday uh, is where I first experienced the Beatles. So it's a holiday I it's, remember quite well. Could I get you to autograph my DVD? <laughs> well, no, it's funny because it was only years later I realized that there's a connection to Al Maria because that's where John made How I Won the War. And wrote Strawberry Fields. And wrote Strawberry Fields. And I assuming, in retrospect, the reason why there was there was Beatles stuff on the streets of Al Maria was because of the, the John Lennon connection. But I didn't put two and two together for about 10 or 15 years. Um, so that was interesting to find out. That was very good. Yeah. That, 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 that's I, a good connection. That's that, a good connection. <laughs> um, so, but is it a good film, Stephen? <sighs> If you if you like spaghetti westerns, if you're a fan of that sort of uh, you know Lee Van Cleef mm. Clint Eastwood style, it's it's an interesting addition to the uh, the canon. Okay. Um, but if you're a fan of Ringo Starr, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend it. It's not one of the films that I would say yes, you could just sit down and enjoy watching Ringo in this. It's 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 not an easy watch, mm. and he's not he's not in it for very long. Yeah. Um, Five out of ten. Five out of ten. Okay, I can't. I can't give a give a a rating because it's the one I haven't seen. I'm afraid, folks. How would you rate Al Maria? Al Maria's a nice part of the world, you know. Jeez. Five, uh, out, five out of ten. Five, I'd be happy to go anywhere at the minute, Stephen. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> right, viewers. Anyway, um, that'll date. Uh, moving on. Moving on. The next movie is a bit of a, a right turn, but it's fantastic. Now, the, here's the good stuff. Born to yep. Boogie, 1972. Um, a U-rated. Apple Films production directed by Ringo Starr and it's a top notch rock bio it's not really is it a biopic it's a, certainly it's, it's it's a Mark Boland T-Rex movie it's a rockumentary if, if you, you will, will. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's fantastic it's 
It is. It's a it's a wonderful thing, and I I I have had this on DVD for a long time. Yeah, and I, it's only in the global pandemic that I sat down to watch it all. I'd kind of dipped in and out of it before, but I, I watched the whole thing, and it it's it's marvelous. It's a marvelous uh, uh, a movie artifact. It, yeah. it is an artifact, and it's fascinating. And uh, and the first thing I'll say is it is it is it is really interesting to see. Ringo Starr from the Beatles with Mark Bolan from T-Rex hanging yeah. out. And, you know, the story is that Bolan was very enamored with the fact that Ringo from the Beatles was interested in him. But they have a nice rapport. Ringo, the because like, Ringo's on camera for, for chunks of it, uh, yes. playing drums in a, in a fantastic studio jamming session. Um, but he's also kind of larking around with Mark Bolan. And he's, you know, it's, it's very charming. It is so. So the, the format is there, there's the, that jam session which takes takes place in the Apple basement in their yeah. studios. Um, you've got uh, live footage uh, of a Wembley show yeah. uh, by by T Rex, and then as you say, you've got these kind of surreal uh, interludes. Yes. Where, where generally Ringo was there, kind of larking around uh, with with Mark Bolan or having tea. Um, you know, in a kind of slightly surreal, Penny yeah. Lane, Strawberry Fields kind of yeah, vibe. The, the dinner table in the field scenario. Yeah, classic. Yeah, yeah, this, uh, classic. Uh, Sixty-seven video. Setup, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's yeah the studio session where it's Elton on the piano, Ringo on drums, uh, Mark Boland doing his thing, and they're singing like Little Richard's Tutti Fruity, and then Mark Boland is sitting in Elton's piano doing Children of the Revolution. It's uh, it's it, it's it, great. If if you watch. None of this film, other than that clip of Elton and Ringo and and Mark, that that's that's the highlight for me. Um, you know, the live the live footage is great. Uh, well, the live footage, it, uh, like how much Ringo directed this, he seems to have actually directed it. The well, live footage is really well captured. The angle, the low angles, and the lack of like it's not very kinetic. The the camera kind of just sits there yeah. and it films chunks, and it's really engaging to watch as opposed to fast cuts and you it's. Know, well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's very different in that sense that you say most concert footage, particularly now, you have sort of swinging cameras over the stage and cutaways and different angles. This is you uh, supposedly Ringo was sort of in the pit at the front of the stage mm. to, behind the camera, sort of directing these individual shots. And it, it, it gives you a real sense of being in the front row yeah. um, at, at the concert. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, some of the... You know the uh, the uh, uh, bongo solo goes on perhaps a little <laughs> bit too long, but you know again it's of its of its time. But um, but it's short. It's only like about seventy minutes anyway. It flies yeah. by, and it's um, it, yeah. It it sort of arose out of a Ringo had this idea that he was going he was going to make documentary films um, about. Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, George Best. I'd have li- I'd like to see Ringo do a documentary mm. about George Best. And that never really came to pass, but Mark Boland was one of the subjects. And then this sort of became uh, a theatrical uh, a theatrical uh, release. And of course, at this stage, T-Rex... Well, you know, that's it. The timing is T-Rex perfect. Yeah. T-Rex mania, you know, Boland mania. It's it, he is the new Beatles, I suppose. Well, one of the um, things about Apple that you know we've kind of talked about a lot is that Apple was so many great ideas poorly executed, you know. And there are yeah. versions of every Apple idea where you can go, "There's the same idea done very well." And yes. uh, but this this thing does seem to line up that this is a great film made by Apple. This is the type of thing they could have been churning out, as you say, if they did do a George Best documentary. And other another bits this works really really well yes if if they had had the sort of personnel mm. you know, the business people to 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 sort of corral the creative ideas yeah this is exactly the type of thing they should have been doing and um ringo is clearly brilliant at this yeah he's you really know, good as you say a lot of it comes down i suppose to his sort of personal chemistry with mark boland but um you can he just he he it, it's a very well executed, well crafted uh, documentary. And uh, the, that acoustic Alice in Wonderland set, that's filmed in Titmus Park, isn't it? So that's yes, just yes. a Beatles connection right there. Beatles connection right there. So again, it's this idea of, uh, you know, everything moves very fast in pop. Um, so you've got T Rex 
and you've got Ringo from the old guard. Yeah, and, and Ringo suppose, does and, seem old, even though there's not much seen, difference. Yes, he, he age, does. You know? It's very much Ringo is the sort of elder statesman. That's what, seven 30, years between Ringo and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, Mark but at you know at thirty years old, I suppose Ringo is is the elder statesman in yeah. this setup. Um, so Mark's out of ten for Born to Boogie. Um, I'd give it eight out of ten. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. that that's a, and, it's a um, great uh, little um, time capsule. It's it's really something. And there's a bit of Mark we, Boland revivalism going on at the minute, which is there nice. is there is. And uh, just before we leave that, I would just mm. like to say the um, the premiere. Oh yeah, uh, the after show party was at Tramps Nightclub. And uh, you had T Rex, Ringo, Elton, Bernie Taupin, Keith Moon, and Donovan. Drink might have been taken. Drink might have been taken. And Donovan um, told them to take it. He <laughs> told them everything. What Donovan to do? Was yeah, yeah, uncredited there. But uh, <laughs> yeah. um, the next movie, uh, we probably should actually mention as a side point that uh, Ringo has also appeared in Two Hundred Motels, the Frank Zappa yes. film. At this point, yes. um, we're not going to go into that. But it's uh, it's uh, it's. I've seen Two Hundred Motels. I can hear the contempt in your voice. <sighs> you know, I, I haven't. I've never seen this movie. I've seen the. I've seen clips and I've seen lots of stills with Ringo dressed up like Frank Zappa. He plays, Larry, up. he plays Larry the Dwarf. Yeah, and so Ringo's dressed up as Frank Zappa and he gives a very odd speech to camera about how to, you know, about what to do with orchestras and it's all very kind of bleak. And um, 200 Motels is a Frank Zappa film which was made in 1970. It was shot in London on videotape and okay, then but... transferred over onto film and sort of became one of these kind of midnight showing things. It depends on what your take is on Frank Zappa. And I definitely did see this as part of this Alex Cox movie drama BBC mm. Two back in the day because I found his introduction on YouTube and watched it. And uh, that's when I saw it. And I really, I went back and looked at it again. And you're either into the Zappa thing or you're not. And I tr I've tried so hard to get into Zappa, but the older I get, I'm just not built for that cynicism that kind of it's you know I, I think it's dating very very poorly his stuff you know I, th I think as a as a teenager as a kind of 14, as a teenager he old... seems an amazing iconoclast you think this guy's yeah. fantastic and I remember seeing his autobiography about 1990 a friend of mine had it and reading it and thinking this guy's amazing and they're like mm. okay I'm gonna try and listen to some of his albums oh Jesus Christ <laughs> <laughs> there, I, I, I think the problem for me is there's so much of it Yes. That's um, not a problem and, with King Crimson, though. <laughs> no, and, it, but it, and it's such a sort of diverse... So, you, you know, you get relatively straightforward things like uh, uh, apostrophe. Yeah. You know, where you've kind of got Jack Bruce is appearing on that, and then you've got some kind of sort of minor scatological humorous yeah. songs, you know, Don't Eat the Yellow Snow. That, that is, his song titles uh, are more interesting well, uh, often than the work. But um, but he also pulled that stunt, like in 200 Motels, Ringo is dressed as Frank Zappa giving a speech, and he did the exact same thing on The Monkees a few years earlier, where he yes. dresses Mike Nesmith as Frank Zappa, and he yeah. tries to present himself, and Zappa appears in Head as well. Uh, with so a it's just a it's a rehash of well, uh, all these things are kind of interlinked but um, yeah, yeah to, I'm, I know people who love Frank Zappa and if you love Zappa I was going to say we, I was going to say we're alienating so many people no I can understand what it's like to you know to, to, to jump into like a massive body of work and to either get it or not get it but uh, I don't get it but anyway Ringo's in, in that movie as well and he makes one or two other cameos we'll mention in a sec but the next big movie that he is in is possibly his most important one or which is that'll be the day, and when I say important, it's it's. I think I think Ringo kind of disappears in that'll be the day because most of the other movies he's in, you're like, oh, there's Ringo, yeah. And in that'll be the day, uh, I think it's possibly his best kind of capture. I, I think so. I think so. You're not you're not conscious of the fact that you know. Hey, it's Ringo Starr. Yeah. So that was so the day you... comes out in 1973, and it stars David Essex. And how would you describe it? It's. Um... It, it it really has a lot of parallels, I think, with uh, the early Beatles. So yeah. it's 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 a, this this guy, the David Essex character, uh, is very good at school, but he's very bored. He uh, runs out on his exams and runs off to join a kind of fun fair. Mm. Has uh, lots of adventures. Uh, comes back home, and then ditches his uh, fiance. Uh, in a parallel with the way his own father had uh, run out on him as a child. And he's last seen sort of heading down the road with his guitar, setting up the the sequel. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, this but, is this is a great movie, and I, I've seen it a few times. And again, it popped up on Talking Pictures TV recently. And yeah, I was like, I'm just going to watch this again. Uh, this is and it's bleak. This, this is yeah. This is this is probably the sort of arguably the best rock British rock film. Mm. You think? It, it, it really, it, but, but part of the, and part of the 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 um the key to its, its success is that it it stars lots of people who were there. Yeah. Um, so like Ringo, so Ringo, we should say, plays the part of a barman. In the a holiday camp, camp kind in of holiday fun camp, area. In, yeah. In the holiday camp, he's a bit of a jack the lad. And of course, Ringo played the Butlins holiday camps with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. And, and they're just tapping into that late 50s. I think that's why uh, he fits vibe. so well. He's not acting. Yeah. He's just reliving he, part of his life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Ringo sort of, his character gets beaten up and, and sort of disappears. Mm. Uh, and maybe it's because, you know, I'm, I'm coming at it from the nothing is real <laughs> standpoint, but the film does sort of dip a little bit. Um, once Ringo, Ringo brings a lot to this film. Well, there's a lot of, cause when, when the band are playing, you know, it's, it's Billy Fury and Keith Moon, uh, who are in the band playing at the yeah. camp, isn't it? So yeah. what I like about that'll be the day is, it really represents well the boredom, the boredom that was in people's yeah. lives in that sort yeah. of, you know, 1950s phase. Like so you read so many, yeah, you read so many books about Elvis came along and we couldn't believe it. But you watch That'll Be The Day and you're like, my God, this is just, did they capture yeah. that ennui fantastically? You know, what are we going to do now? There isn't much going on, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, I think I think this is this is this is this is it. It's perfect kind of snapshot. Um, the the screen. This this was a film that was written by Ray Connolly. Yes. So again, there's more Beatles connection there. Uh, people will know Ray Connolly. You know, he's a rock journalist. I suppose is how you would describe him. He mm. worked for the Evening Standard. He interviewed the Beatles in the '60s. Um, he was a journalist to whom Lennon confided. Uh, that he had left the Beatles and then said, yes. keep that to yourself. <laughs> and he did. And then Lennon criticized him for doing that. Um, uh, there's a very good archive. There's a book. It was originally a, a website, but there's the Ray Connolly Beatles archive, uh, which is a very good book, which collects various interviews. And supposedly he was due to interview John uh, the day that he died. Oh, right. Um, so, but he went to sort of speak to Ringo about the holiday camp and about the, he spoke to Neil Aspinall because he had never been to Butlins, a holiday camp himself. And and he suddenly then in, in having that conversation realized that Ringo would be the perfect, uh, the perfect person for this role. Mm. Yeah. It, it, it's a great film. And like many films of this era, you know, sometimes in the modern era, you forget how to watch old films. It just sort of ends. Yes. It just, so you're like watching, oh my God, you know, what's going on? And it just sort of, he walks off into the sunset at the end. And, and there, it does set up a sequel, Stardust, which it, Ringo it, isn't it, in. It does, but I, 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 I'm not sure from looking at the Ray Connolly sort of website and, and his, his sort of recounting that he was he was intending to have a sequel. Right. Um, I think it was just the case that, you know, the, the, the end was him leaving, yeah. walking out on his fiance the way his father had walked out on him as a child. And that was the sort of the end. Um, and he, he says that he was inspired by the Harry Nilsson song, 1941. Yes. A father had a son um, and walked out the door. Father had a son, yeah. Uh, which is, of course, Harry Nilsson's um, story. Experience, uh, yep. his, his, his story. But. Um, so yeah, it, it, it then sets up the sequel. Um, Ringo declined to be in the sequel and they cast Adam Faith, yeah. who uh, people who aren't from the UK might not know. He was a sort of late 50s, early 60s singer. Um, and he was cast in the same character, but just a different, uh, different Stardust actor. is crazy. Stardust is it's, crazy. It's, it's great. It's, it's Yeah, it's it's bizarre. It's bizarre. Uh, but supposedly, supposedly Ringo declined to be in the sequel because he said having lived through the experience in reality as a member of the Beatles I'm not I don't want to go there so Stardust is really about this meteoric rise to fame and sort of collapse of the main character into kind of drug addiction uh, and what would your marks out of 10 be for that'll be the day I would give it 
10, uh, I was going to say 10, 9, 9. 9. I think 9 is generous he enough. Leaves, he leaves, Ringo, if Ringo had been all, all the way to the end, I think <laughs> I'd have given it 10. But 9, I think. Uh, nine. So, so we kind of talked about this arc of Ringo's career where he's in the Beatles and he's in movies and then he's solo and he's making a name for himself and he's doing That'll Be The Day and Born To Boogie and, you know, giving it a, you know, blind man, giving it a good... Um, a good go. But then we tilt into the last phase where perhaps things are happening more for the fun of it. And we mentioned a moment ago Harry Nielsen and he shuffles into the frame for our next movie on The Countdown, if you like Casey Kasem, hey. uh, which is 1974's Son of Dracula. Yes. Um, do you want to give us the Son of Dracula uh, summary? Well, again, this is a standard rock and roll vampire movie. Yep. Um, the, the main thing is recounting the coronation of Harry Nilsson playing the part of Count Down as King of the Netherworld at a monstrous convention held in the basement dungeon of a horror museum. There you go. And no, just, just the usual. <laughs> it's uh, your, your broad take. First of all, Son of Dracula is, as we said, it's, it's Ringo and Harry having a bit of a laugh, you could say. Yes, but it is yes. made by Apple. It is an Apple film. I know it's 1974 and Apple is kind of going to the wall, but it is made by it, Apple. It is. And supposedly uh, Ringo bankrolled this personally yeah. uh, to the tune of, you know, several hundred thousand pounds. Um, and what's uh, your take on Son of Dracula? Because I know how I feel about it. Well, I knew the album okay. before I knew the movie. And the album is quite good, but the most interesting thing about the album is the cover with that kind of fold out <laughs> Harry Nelson vampire cloak. Yeah. Um, then I sort of read about it and I, I knew it by its reputation. And then I started watching little bits of it and I thought, oh, this is a terrible, terrible, terrible movie. And I watched it for the first time all the way through, um, I suppose, back in March. And then I watched it again. And then I watched it for a third time. And I have to say, every time I watch it, it just gets better and better. It's really quite good. I mean, yeah. it's 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 bad, but it's very but it's really enjoyable. I mean, <laughs> yes. it's it, 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 it's one thing where you're you're watching something bad and you're like, you know, you know, this is a waste of my time. But uh, Son of Dracula is one of those things where, again, if I flicked across the TV and it popped on, I'm like, but I haven't seen it on TV. It doesn't. It seems no. to have disappeared. It is a lot of fun, and there are lots of really good things to recommend about it. Uh, would you agree? I would. It's very frustrating that it's it's a bad second, third, fourth, fifth generation copy on YouTube. Copy on YouTube. This is this is. I would love to see a, a kind of remastered, cleaned up print of this this film. My feeling is like Ringo plays Merlin and he's reprising his role as the magical mystery tour wizard. Yes, know, yes. With his hat and his beard and his overacting, um, and and Ringo is uh, he's not very good in this. I, at I all. have to say. Ringo is probably the least good. I'm trying to think of the right word. The least good. Ringo is probably the least interesting part of this film. And what is interesting um, is that Nielsen is really good. He is very good. And actually, he should have done more acting. He's 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 he fits in because the, the the thing with this type of movie, Son of Dracula, and it reminded me, you know, at this time we're talking that you know Hammer were kind of in making doing yeah. their movies and what hammer movies would have and i'm not a horror movie expert but they would always have great actors in them and yes. there are great actors dotted around son of dracula and you know doing the the hokey you know script whatever it is yeah. but harry i think does the sad vampire thing really quite well he he does he is excellent and i'd only ever seen him in a in a sort of a tv uh and American clips from an American TV show where he mm. sort of played the part of a singer, so he's 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 playing himself. But no, he he is actually very good, and 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 he is probably the best thing. And as you say again, there's lots of British character actors. You've you've got Dennis Price, Freddie Jones, Susanna Lee. Um, it 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 absolutely wants to be uh, that kind of campy Hammer horror. Mm. style film but with rock and roll um and it's not a bad idea because if you think about what's in the ether at the time you have movies like young frankenstein being funny yep. you have yep. movies like the rocky horror which goes on yep. to become very influential and you know it's not a, a million miles away to think that son of dracula could have if it had landed properly gone into that space somewhere i i th I, I think rocky horror is a very good uh sort of comparison mm. and i think it wouldn't have taken very much for this uh to sort of 
you know build up that sort of slow build to cult following yeah um but this this uh, and i'm guessing it's probably because of the demise of apple yes that it just didn't get a fair bite that, of the apple. yes <laughs> so so that it, it 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 doesn't do well on first release but as you say rocky horror or with nail and i those type of films that that aren't particularly well appreciated uh, when they're first released but suddenly um they just well not suddenly but over time they build and they gradually sort of uh, achieve this cult status um i think this would be i i, I think this really needs to be cleaned up and put I out would again buy it. i would buy it i, know, I, know, buy that's it my, I know that's my uh, <laughs> catchphrase but i would definitely buy this but what i think is 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 great about it is um you know the the thing that is really worth seeing it for are some of the performances. So Harry Nilsson is this uh, vampire who, after a hundred years, has to take over the mantle of the family. Blah blah blah, and all he wants to do is uh, boogaloo. All he wants to do is yes. rock and roll and play with the band. Yeah. And there's a fantastic performance scene of Jump into the Fire, which is a song that just keeps coming back to life. LCD Sound System have a great version, all the rest, and that's some band who are playing Jump into the Fire. Who's in that band? We've got John Bonham, you may have heard of him. Yes. Uh, Klaus Wurman, yes. maybe heard of him. Peter Frampton. Comes alive. Uh, and uh, Bobby Keys. Yeah. Um, and uh, Keith Moon takes a turn. Keith after Moon constantly goal. popping up wherever Ringo's so, in front of a camera. <laughs> so you've got Ringo, Harry Nilsson, Keith Moon, John Bonham, you know, uh, you kind of get the vibe that must have been going on. But this is what set. we're talking about, where the lifestyle is taking over from yes. the movie making. And that's that's where the, the, the suffering is. But uh, Son of Dracula is definitely worth looking at. It's 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 got... It's got the Channel Tunnel in it about that's, 15 that's, years before the Channel Tunnel is built. That's insane because, Which, okay, you can kind of think, well, we've got a tunnel, but it's... They got it right. It, they got it absolutely right. It's like a, he, a Harry arrives in the UK in a hearse. Uh, on a in, in, which is on a train transporter, so they got it right that oh you you know you have to put your car on a, a train to get it across. Uh, the yeah. tunnel. this was fourteen years before the Channel Tunnel was even begun. And there's some great uh, views of the West End when he's walking around the West End. That, uh, which is nice. That is probably my favourite sort of scene apart from the musical numbers where Harry is kind of wandering through the rain soaked old uh, Soho West End. when it's old still Soho. a bit kind of dirty yeah um, um, it, it's it's great the, the, the intriguing thing and I think we mentioned this in our 1974 episode is obviously Ringo had a little bit of a kind of uh, you know failure of confidence in this and he called Graham Chapman in mm. um, to, to write an entirely new script that they could overdub <laughs> uh, onto the existing film, and um, uh, they recorded a kind of alternative soundtrack. And I'm thinking, does that exist? Somewhere? If that exists, that'd be amazing. Because this, sort of this is a... isn't particularly funny per se. It's kind of a, the, the premise is funny, but it's, yeah. it's actually trying to do a horror thing as well. It's not full of gags. No, I think it's it, that. That's the sort of the failing is. It's neither one. It's neither particularly scary. It's yeah. a little bit campy. It's not particularly funny. And I, 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 I and I say Ringo does not give a good performance. And we we know that Ringo is capable in this kind of uh, environment. And I, I I do wonder if he suddenly realized that he he was looking at hundreds of thousands of pounds of his own money <laughs> disappearing. And, and the mantle of producer was sort of weighing slightly heavily. On yeah. him. Uh, everything he does is sort of delivered in that deadpan, flat, yeah, this uh, kind of pantomime acting that he does. Yeah, it's yes, it's a very exaggerated. That's exactly it. It is a kind of uh, pantomime. But uh, if, if this was cleaned up and yep. given a DVD or a Blu-ray release, yeah. complete with an alternative uh, soundtrack that you could, you know, watch the second version of it. I mean, this would be great. Absolutely, I could stick it in a double disc thing with the album itself. You know, like yep. uh, I picked up Slade in Flame recently. It's a nice album. DVD yep. set, the kind of thing you want. Um, did you notice in the background of? Oh, by the way, the the the, the Harry Nielsen's vampire character is called Countdown, which yes. is a joke that just keeps not giving. Not giving. <laughs> yeah. um, but did you notice in the the apartment that he's living in uh, that the furniture was Ringo or Robin furniture? No, I did not. There you go. I it has not. that that crazy sliding circular Ringo and Robin shelves are in the background from I'm, Ringo's I'm, furniture I'm, company. You know what this means? I'm going to have to watch it again. I think you should. Right, right now. Um, um, right now. Um, perhaps, um, perhaps Ringo, if Ringo is listening, he could get in touch and let us know, does the alternative uh, soundtrack exist and why is this not um, 
Oh, it's a, being, it's a great being, thing. Being revisited. And we did mention in 1974 that um, uh, the episode that uh, Ringo and Harry were in preliminary talks to do a TV special as well at the same time. Yes. And some of that footage has appeared since. Like, uh, it's basically about 20 seconds of, of test footage with animation. It was very interesting to see. Um, but Ringo, uh, um, Son of Dracula is definitely not as bad as its reputation uh, suggests. I mean, you know, it's not great, but it's got a huge curiosity value, great musical performances. And if you're in the right mood, it'll pass 90 minutes very, yeah. very pleasantly. I'm, I'm going to give it uh, seven, seven out of ten. Seven out of ten. Yeah, I think if you're in the right mood, seven out of ten. If you're talking about I'm, technically, I'm, it's two out of yeah. ten. But yeah, if you're in the but, mood, it's seven out of ten. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and around the same time, Ringo does another um, uh, cameo in Listomania. Not a movie I've seen in full. I've watched Ringo's bits. I've, I've, uh, yeah, I've watched all bits of it. Son of Tommy, in a way. It's just... <sighs> If, if you if, yeah if you like Tommy stick with Tommy yeah That's my exactly advice. um so we're into the home stretch now of Ringo movies and we're kind of heading into the um the good stuff the regretful stuff uh, so the we've regretful got, years so we've got two movies to come on to next and the first one is the one that's probably gone down in legend as being <laughs> the worst of the worst which is 1977s or 78s 78. I, think, I think it was made in 77 released in yeah. 78 um sextet and if you've never heard of sextet you are lucky and i think we should wrap up the podcast and you should go home and never hear about it never if, hear you, about if you want to learn about sextet um yeah. Uh, proceed, proceed at your own risk proceed. <laughs> yes listen now uh steven tell us about sextet this is a 1978 American musical comedy film starring the 84-year-old Mae West in the lead, wait for it, sex kitten role. Mm. So the plot is basically <laughs> that Mae West, Marlowe Manners, and her new sixth husband arrive uh, at their honeymoon hotel and are unable to consummate the marriage because they're constantly interrupted by dress fittings, photo sessions, as well as various men, including her father, from former husbands, who are all want to have sex with Mae West and retrieve <laughs> an incriminating cassette tape of her body memoirs. And quite frankly, once again, we've all been there. We've all been there. Good, good use of the body again. <laughs> which of us cannot say that we have uh, burst in on an ex's honeymoon trying to retrieve a copy of her memoirs. So so we need to point out that um, when she arrives with her sixth husband, this person is played by Timothy Dalton, who goes on to be 007 James, Jim, yeah, Timothy I'm, Bond. <laughs> I, I, I think Timothy I, I should have checked how old he was, but, you know, he's he's not he, old. He's not old, and all he wants to do is... Um, um, have sex with Mae West. Yes, 84-year-old Mae West. And yeah. uh, all these ex-husbands keep coming into the picture to distract and to, um, you know... Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's as bad as it sounds. It's, it's just, it's beyond awful. But again, are, the cast list. Yeah. So... Uh, you've got Ringo, Ringo yes. George Hamilton, yeah. Walter Pigeon, mm -hmm. uh, Dom DeLuise, yeah. Tony Curtis, Keith Moon again. The first person you see in this movie is the late, great Regis Philbin. Yes. Which, when yeah. I, yes. So, so I've never watched Sextet and uh, for the purposes of chatting today, I thought I really have to bite the bullet and watch this. And I put it on and uh, Regis Philbin comes on as a, yeah. which, as a reporter, which is just... Uh, it's just crazy, and it, it it answers. There are so many questions raised. Like, like how, this woman is that the character that Mae West plays, who's as we said, is eighty four, is so famous that there are reporters in the hotel lobby reporting on whether the marriage has been consummated or not because that's yeah, normal. There are, there are crowds outside. She is. It's 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 it's, it's literally every move that she makes is being commented upon and, and followed and reported on and and um <laughs> it's 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 weird i mean it's just oh. it, it, it's 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 terrible um <laughs> and and they just i mean she's very made up yeah uh, and they just sort of move her around the set like she's on casters um and, it, and they they get her to deliver her famous you know, come up and see me sometime, yeah. or it's not the men in my life, it's the life in my men. I mean, it's a, it's a series of, of 
well, uh, catchphrases. The, the legend of the movie is that she was wearing an earpiece and she was being fed her lines. Yes. And, you know, I can believe it. I can believe it. And she's always kind of photographed in this kind of blurry fuzzy lit old There's a Hollywood lot of, kind of, lot way. of Vaseline on the lens of the yes. camera. Yeah. And all her lines are delivered in that um, da, 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 kind of Mae West tone. Yeah. yeah. And they're, every line she delivers, uh, there's always about six people in the room who deliver about a 1.5 second burst of laughter, which then yeah. stops. And then she goes, no, 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 no. And then everyone <laughs>, laughs and stops again. Yeah. And it's, it's really strange. And when I was watching this, it's on YouTube. And uh, I, um, I, I, I was about 10 minutes in and I was like, please, please make this stop. stop. And, uh, but you know, on YouTube, you can change the speed, the playback speed of something <laughs> you're watching. And okay. I'm telling you folks, if you put Sextet up to, you know, 1.75 or two times the speed, May West sounds like 1930s May West because okay. it, it everybody's performance is slowed down to match her performance, uh, which makes it stultifyingly dull to watch. And well, oh god, it's I can't, it's it's all coming well, back. Apparently, to me. apparently, she was uh, incredibly deaf, mm. um, so it was very difficult to kind of give her direction. And there's a story, um about a scene in an, in an elevator, which took most of the day to film. And <laughs> after the scene, the director called rap, uh, but she wasn't within hearing range. So she just stay in the elevator. Oh God, love her. Uh, <laughs> for half an hour before anyone realized that uh, they had to go. Um, I think what I've written here in my notes is that the low point is Mae West reciting the lyrics to Babyface. Yeah. If it were not for the world's worst Beatles cover, which is Dom DeLuise singing Honey Pie. Oh, that's bizarre. Dom DeLuise just starts singing Honey Pie for no particular for no reason. reason. Uh, no. and, and, and when I was watching it for the first time, I was about 10 minutes in when the first song came on and I was like, oh Jesus, no, there's music. There's singing and dancing as well. <laughs> it's, it's so many things done badly. Um, it's Yeah, it's really really weird there's this athletic room scene where may west kind of wanders into a room with about you know it's like an american basketball team or something yeah and just starts you know doing all these lines and all everyone's laughing at her and it's um with her with her jason he's laughing with her but but like one of the ex-husbands is george hamilton who's just come off the godfather you know one of the greatest films of all time and he's doing like a godfather pastiche in it it's so strange Yeah, yeah, it's awful. Ring, I mean, it, it, you know, and Ringo it, is doing very loud, very broad, very bad. He's in it for about four minutes. I timed yes. it, and he's not. Uh, he's, very he's, good. He plays the part of a former husband, I think, um, with some weird, uh, sort of geographically inexact accent. Yeah, uh, and uh, he's clearly off his head. He, he is. You can he's, tell he's, when, when Ringo's neck beard goes out of control. That's that. That they're the bad Ringo years. You know, that's about. He 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 is just. He is, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure he has no memory of this film whatsoever. Well, I found a bit of footage of him being interviewed about it recently. And he's, he's mm-hmm. like, you know, he's quite, he, he knows so, it's not a good film. And he's like, listen, just wanted to meet Mae West and hang out. And, you know, she was, you know, a legend. And, uh, but the highlight of the film? Keith Moon, isn't it? Keith Moon. Keith, Keith, Moon, Keith Moon appears as, as a dress designer. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, in, he's in it only for about two minutes. Yes. But it, it's worth watching those two minutes don't watch the whole film find the two minutes with keith moon he is hilarious and this is how you imagine keith moon behaved in real life well you know keith moon does that thing where you know he pops up in tommy or whatever you know he's doing these little mini micro roles and he's just perfect he's got great presence great charisma he's ebulliently funny you don't want to watch him for an hour and a half but he's just very 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 good in this thing yeah Um, keith Keith moon is one of those people that i think i would like to spend some time in his company but probably no more than five or ten minutes in his company i i mean broadly speaking some of the stuff he did was a bit great he'd be he'd be be great crack for about 10 minutes and then i think it would wear thin so two minutes in this but he is clearly enjoying himself and i imagine that was one tick yeah um, and then literally he walks out the door and keeps talking as he leaves and, uh, <laughs> I, I, it, well yeah. there's there's um there's you know spoiler alert but it kind of is revealed towards the end of the movie that the timothy dalton character is like this 007 secret spy <laughs> which yeah. is like oh my god what a what a twist kind of thing yeah um and a bit of foreshadowing for for yeah. timothy dalton's yeah. um yeah latest uh late later uh, career um so yeah i would you tell people to watch it no 
I didn't hesitate. No, I, I, I originally had marked this as three out of 10, but I actually think it's probably two out of 10. It's really, really bad. But however, I'm going to flip something just for the sake of it, because, you know, if you think about it, Stephen, maybe there's something broader at play here because I have a theory. I was just about to say, do you have a theory? Jason? I have a theory. And my theory is actually that Ringo is playing the long game, that sextet is the flip of candy and makes a very serious point about ageist views and sexuality. Huh? Have I just, have I revealed myself to be ageist? Just saying. Why yeah. is it that, you know, we are all kind of laughing and mocking a sexualized 84 year old who wants to um, bed all her ex-husbands, but we are not horrified about the movie about an 18 year old being chased by six old men. <laughs> I was horrified by that movie too. <laughs> you said it was the best what? movie ever. I'll rewind the tape. <laughs> Candy? Candy, yeah. No? No. You no, don't. I didn't say that. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, you rewind didn't. Rewind the tape. Rewind. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm appalled by all of these movies. But there you go. Uh, Sextet, if you see it uh, hand in hand with Candy, they're actually the yin and yang. No? Oh, I'm not watching them again. No, no, no. That's a very, that's a very difficult uh, leap to make. Do you um, think there's candy and sex that in a double bill at your <laughs> local Odeon? Oh my God! Even that, yeah. Well, if you know, so, some some cinemas need to be kept empty these days, so that'd be a good true. way of, of doing it. Well, I, I think there well, is there is a school of thought that says that about sex death that says good on Mae West for making this movie about a sexy eighty four year old, and well, you know we should rethink our position on 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 these kind of attitudes I, I, in society. But yeah, I mean, I I, it still I can doesn't make see it a good movie. It doesn't make it a good movie, and I can see that. But you 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 know you do get a sense that. She was in no way in control of this. No, and if like the 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 the, the cast or the the credits at the start say it's based on her play, and it does have it's very much set up like a play. Yeah. But the play is about written about thirty or forty years earlier and was never really produced. So they basically no. took this idea off the scrap heap. It wasn't a play written about somebody who's in their eighties. It was written about somebody who's in their forties who'd had a load of husbands, yeah. and you know that might. Uh, you, uh, yeah, well, I mean, still I, I, sense, I, really. I, I could see it. I mean, I suppose these days it might be about someone who was in their 60s or their 70s, mm. you know, on the basis that 70 is the new 40 or something. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, clinging, I'm, I'm clinging to that. Uh, yeah, you but, keep saying um, that. It doesn't make it true. <laughs> yeah, um, may, maybe. But uh, you, you, uh, I felt uncomfortable because you kind of think. I don't uh, think she's I, in on it. I don't think she's in on it. That's exactly it. I, yeah. I think I, I don't think she's. Uh, in control and yeah. I think people are much like ourselves are laughing at her rather than with her yeah. she's, she's not present you, you know you kind of get a sense that she's not aware of really what's going on and she's just yeah, say, and that's it's, a pity it's, it's because she she was someone with a fantastic legacy who actually yes. created a screen persona back in the early days of talkies, which was very striking and strident and important, you know? Yeah. So I do think yeah. it is oh, a pity absolutely. that this is her. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking away from her uh, kind of importance as, a, as an actress sort of back in the day, but I, I, I think this is a very unfortunate sort of end to them. Yeah, and it, it, it's kind of, you know, it's sad that her career sort of has this punchline, you know? Yeah, um, but you're, you're, you're bringing the party down. Sorry, well then, let's let's end Ringo's well, uh, cinematic odyssey with our well, next wait, before, with the, or did before, I miss something? Uh, you miss something? What I, want, what I want to do is give a, a shout out to uh, another podcast. Oh, I don't know. Oh, go on then. <laughs> Smush Pod. Yes, yes, um, indeed. Which uh, is an excellent podcast, uh, primarily started off about uh, the Bond movies, but um, sort of diversified um, this is a very funny episode uh, on sex that. sex that, which you should not listen to if you're driving or operating heavy machinery. It's, it's highly recommend you check that out. It's much more entertaining than the movie. That's interesting. I didn't know there were other podcasts. That's interesting. Um, there, are, there are no other music podcasts. <laughs> so on to uh, the final big tentpole Ringo film, which is kind of, I think, the end of Ringo's cinematic ambition or career, certainly as a headliner, which is 1981's caveman um, I'm, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing this is your favorite film well you know no i it's not but well tell us give us the synopsis of caveman 
Okay. Uh, the first thing is this, this, this features no dialogue, but in the course of slapstick adventures, cavemen discover marijuana, fire, mm -hmm. invent roast chicken, music, weapons, and learn how to walk upright. Ringo becomes the tribe's new leader, and he and his mate, who interestingly is not Barbara Bach, who is in this film, yes. live happily ever after. Yeah, his mate is played by uh, Shelley Long, who obviously went on from to be... Um, uh, Cheers, Diane. Yes, the same female cast member from Cheers. And um, it's... Caveman is... It feels dated. Well, everything from the 80s is, is, <laughs> I know, but... is, is dated in a way... No, but, but in a way that things from the 70s and things from the 90s often are not. I mean... You know, it stars Dennis Quaid for a start. Um, <laughs> but it, here's what I think about Caveman, because we're talking about some of these movies and we're having a laugh and all the rest, but sometimes you're kind of thinking, why was this made or how did this happen? And I kind of think, no, I can kind of understand a slight logic in how Caveman became made, you know, got made as a movie. But it seems as if it was a couple of years too late. It, it, like, if you think, yes. it, it reminds me of... Um, that kind of run of movies that Mel Brooks had, where he had Young Frankenstein, which is a black and white film, and he had Blazing Saddles, yep. a Western. He had Silent exactly. Movie, which is a silent movie, and High Anxiety. So it's one of those kind of comedy genre pieces because it's, it's kind of a pseudo-silent Ray Harryhausen it, film. It is. It's a kind of send-up of, what's that Raquel Welsh film, One Million yeah, Years, years BC? BC. It's, yeah, it's yeah. That, or, or, as you say, the kind of stop-motion uh, dinosaurs and things like that. It is a... It is a send up of that but as you yeah. say it's, it's a couple of years too late yeah and it, you, you could kind of see you know if it had been like a mel brooks type film and it had even maybe starred mel brooks in the ringo role you yeah. know you can kind of see uh, you know how that would uh, come to be because it was directed by uh carl gottlieb who sort of was in i think i think he might have been a um did he work with mel brooks or he certainly was 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 of that uh, era um uh, and, you know, it's, it's got a reasonably strong cast. You know, Barbara Bach is there and she's just come off The Spy Who Loved Me a year or yep. two earlier. Um, so you can kind of see how it might have been a good idea, but it, it gets um, it gets old very fast, the, the premise of a, it. it. It seems to me that it's a kind of 30 minute TV show or it's a couple of sketches yeah. that, that have just been kind of elongated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know it's a bit kind of slapsticky, but as you say, it's it's very dated. Yeah, you and, know, it's, it's, it, it, and there it, is some it, lovely stop motion animations in it, but I just associate that with movies twenty or thirty years earlier. You know, yeah. Uh, it just um, it's, it's not, you know it's not you know the first Flintstones movie. Yeah, yeah. That kind of comedy. Mm. You think well, it, that did it a little better than this. Yeah. Um, and and high praise. You know, <laughs> high praise. And 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 the kind of lack of dialogue is is that just gets. I didn't. I didn't make it to the end of this movie. I have to say, it's you'd you'd certainly skip through it on on YouTube, you know. And it's it's the, you know it's got one or two nice little bits in it, and I see what they're reaching for, but just but, no. But you but you see what I mean? It's a kind of like a sketch or it's yeah. a punchline in search of a joke. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's um. But the the best bit is where they're all sitting around the campfire and um, uh, somebody blows into a. Oh, kind yeah. of a jug and realizes it produces a musical sound and this kind of they start adding to it and it they, they discover music and that that's a that would be a great little kind of uh saturday night live sketch or something <laughs> um and it, it has a beatles reference right at the start doesn't it this yeah so bear in mind when this was this this came out in 1981 so it opens in the way that all prehistoric uh, films open with a, a you know one zillion years ago mm. on the 9th of october which is John's birthday. John's birthday. And this, this so, movie came out in April 81, just a few yeah, months. Yeah, so it seems to be just a little bit of a nod uh, uh, to, uh, to John. And, yeah. um, but this was, this, as you say, this is the point where I think, uh, you know, Ringo is, is enjoying the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's fair to say that his co-star, Dennis Quaid, was enjoying the lifestyle. Certainly. And uh, Bar Barbara Bach too um, yes and you know they you know the the ringo at this point is in his 40s there aren't going to be any more ringo star starring vehicles and no. but you know himself and barbara meet up and they are still together to this day so if his career has left him with uh oh. the, in a happier place then more power to his elbow i guess all, all's well and this is this is the 
promotional interview that we've talked about before where he goes on the John Davidson show yeah. and he's completely hammered. Yeah. And he's, he's in a bad way. And there is some interviews of them together, uh, Ringo and Barbara, on the Today Show in summer 1981 in the wake of mm. Caveman coming out. And they're a bit, you know, refreshed yeah they're they, you know they're 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 not as bad as the, the john davidson interview but no. they're still obviously um uh, high on life and uh, <laughs> which they've subsequently been quite candid about talking about at the time but yeah, yeah caveman it doesn't really even have any kind of curiosity value or you know fun value that son of dracula no. has I can't, no. uh, what's your what's your uh what's your final rating I'm 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 giving it four out of ten and i'm saying this is fairly unwatchable unless you're stoned I imagine. Yes. Stoned like a caveman and would have a stone thrown yeah, at him. Yeah. That's it, Jason. That's it. That's what that means. Uh, so that's caveman. So so that's the kind of the arc of Ringo's films from 68 to 81. And whether it could have gone in another direction, I don't know. But there's a couple of postscripts we might wrap up on uh, talking about. The first one is we're, we'll do two or three hours now on a movie called Give My Regards to Broad Street that came out in, let me just check my papers, 1984. And it was written it's... by... Um, uh, somebody called Paul McCartney uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. McCartney but sadly uh, sadly we don't have time for that but <laughs> I, I, if we can leave that I, I, I promise you we, we, will, we will do at some point it'll in the never future happen. It'll never happen. Uh, never we, do. we will do an entire episode on this film which <laughs> I have never seen. Yes, I do think it would be fun to put you in front of it for the first time and uh, I mean, just I've record seen, I've your seen, responses. I've seen, I've seen bits of it. Yes, you know, but, but you've yeah, looked at those pictures on the sleeve of the soundtrack and wondered, but, wow, I'd love to see that film. Yeah. Um, but there are two things that uh, left that we're going to pick. One is a favourite of yours and one is a favourite of mine. Um, I feel already I'm being... Uh, no, because I think my... I think I think your choice is excellent. Uh, the, the one I want, the one I meant to mention first is a 2016 film that Ringo pops up in, which is uh, Pop Star, uh, Never Stop Never Stopping, which is a very very funny film, and it's it from is very funny. yeah, it's uh, it's from the Lonely Island people. If you know the Lonely Island, they're um, they're a trio uh, who uh, were on Saturday Night Live, uh, who went off to to do greater things. So Andy Samberg is the star of the. Uh, pop star never stop never stopping and uh, Yorm and Kiva are the two of the members of Lonely Island who uh, also appear in the film and, and direct it and it's a uh, another mockumentary about uh, uh, Sandberg's character is Connor for real who is uh, <laughs> for real for real who's you know trying to make a comeback and it's just it's 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 very, very funny. But Ringo appears, there's plenty, there's these talking heads that pop up throughout the the movie kind of talking about the history and their relationship with the band. And Ringo just pops up as one of these talking heads. And it's very funny to just have him in the middle of all this acting seriously. Do you think we get Mr. Sandberg on the podcast? Do you think I would... would love to get Andy Sandberg. I'm a huge Lonely Island fan. And, you know, they, they did the digital shorts on SNL for years. A lot of SNL turning up on today's podcast. Um uh and and their musical comedy is sensational there's there's yeah, just so the, much good the, stuff their, their three albums are fantastic i'll just say um, they, they they do my favorite ever christmas song i leave it at that well i think i know which which one you're talking about <laughs> um the uh so yeah that's pop star never stop never stopping which is a very silly um and it's definitely 18s rated uh comedy that ringo pops up in but you uh pushed me in direction of something else which i think uh we need to talk about uh, which it might, might be ringo's might, yeah. finest moment it We're, might we've been, be ringo's it might be Ringo's We've been looking moment. for a 10 out of 10 moment. What is it? This is the Powerpuff Girls Dance Pants, <laughs> which came out. It's a TV short and it came out in 2014. Uh, it's a, an animated uh, uh, film, I suppose. And uh, he plays the character Fibonacci Sequins. It's a great mathematical pun. Like he's yeah. a glam rock sequins guy, but he's yeah. also a professor of maths, this character. And, and it's, um, this is the best thing Ringo's ever done. It is really it's, funny it's, and charming. It's, and, you know, it, it's not even telling you that it's Ringo, you know, it's... Uh, no, it's just, I mean, but it's obviously him. People, people will think we're, we're, we're just kind of, you know, being facetious here, but it is genuinely entertaining. It's very, very funny. And if you ever wanted to see a cartoon Ringo in a tutu singing, I wish I was a Powerpuff Girl, <laughs> this is the place to go. 
This is this is exactly it, and uh, it it is very very funny. The Powerpuff Girls is a funny cartoon. It's um, one of those things that you don't mind uh, the kids putting on. There is a well, we, yes, we we started this by by saying you know there's there's language and there's some inappropriate things. This is entirely appropriate uh, for for, for the whole family. And there the is a family. there is a another uh, Powerpuff Girls episode called Meet the Beatles, spelled B E A. B-E-A-T hyphen A-L-L-S, who are uh, the, the Powerpuff Girls have to fight a group of supervillains called the Beat Alls. Um, wow. But this cartoon, it's another 10 minute Powerpuff cartoon, but it has more Beatle references in it than the Free as a Bird video. It's worth, <laughs> worth pulling out because uh, it, it came on the television in our house one day and I was like, oh, I know, I, know, I get all these jokes. I know what's going on. Um so- are we are we looking at doing a special episode on the Powerpuff Girls? We I think there's probably a whole a whole a whole podcast, a whole podcast. On Powerpuff Girls Beatles crossover. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it's nice that Ringo uh, at this stage is kind of popping up in things where I, he's a lot lot uh, more laid so. back I mean, about he, what's going on. Yeah, I mean there are, there are comments online about you know oh how could he possibly do this or this? Lit? I I think it just he is clearly incredibly comfortable with his role his legacy his position and i i think it's great that he's he's doing this kind of kind of stuff yeah and you know he loves the all-round entertainer thing he loves being famous uh you know he you know when when he did find his groove you know we haven't even mentioned thomas the tank engine but that was something that you know suited him like a glove yeah, and I mean, at the time, people were sort of saying, "Oh, this is such a calm down," or "This is this is." But but you know, again, it's back to your point about him playing the long game. Yeah, um, you know that 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 has legs, that has traction, that's still something, and it's it's great. It's yeah. just fun and it's enjoyable, and uh, yeah, that's you know, ring all love. over, peace, peace and love. Yeah, peace and love. That's all he wants to do is just bring a little bit of joy. Um, but what do you think, folks? Uh, have you seen any of these? Beatles films? Have we made you want to see any of these Beatles films? Have we made you want to take your television and throw it into the sea? Uh, let us uh, know. Have, <laughs> or you, have, you, have you cancelled cancelled your subscription to this podcast? <laughs> well, you know, listen. Sometimes it, it can't all be um, copiously dense <laughs> facts. We, we watched this the most. <laughs> this is the most time I've had <laughs> through uh, any episode. Hours. I'm telling you, folks. The, the 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 playback speed on YouTube is your friend. <laughs> Um, so that's my top tip you know that's the only way to watch sex dead in about half an hour um but let us know what you think uh, it's certainly a curious uh, fingerprint uh, of movies that he has made and it's part of the beatles magic that the only reason we're talking about these things today in the 21st century is that there's a thread that connects them back to uh, everybody's favorite group the beatles and that's just uh, that's just the magic that makes the whole thing interesting you know Yes, I agree. And, <laughs> and the, 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 once you start watching these films, it's the little connections that, that pop up all mm-hmm. the way through his career, you know, whether it's Don DeLuise and Sack Dead singing Honey Pie or the fact that Keith Moon keeps popping up um, or yeah, it's the- an Apple, Apple films or, you know, Harry Nilsson is in Son of Dracula and Harry Nilsson's song 1941 inspires That Will Be The Day. It's, it's a weird... You just realise uh, you're living in a Beatles universe and we just yeah, need to get used to it. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, so let us know what you think, folks. Have you seen these? Do you want to go see them? We're available in all the usual places. We're on Twitter at Beatles Pod. Uh, you can go to Facebook for the um, private Nothing Is Real Facebook group and Stephen will let you in. And we're popping up in other online places as well. Um, but... We hope you join us next time. Thanks for listening. For Nothing Is Real, I'm Jason Carty. I'm Stephen Cockcroft. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Nothing Is Real is powered by Acast. Acast.